So welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Cheyenne Joseph. I'm an executive director at the Rising Sun Treatment Center, uh, which is a alcohol and drug rehab center in Eel Ground First Nation in Northern New Brunswick. Um, today I'm here as the co-chair of COSIN's Climate Driven Infectious Disease Advisory Committee. So I'm happy to welcome all of you to the third session of COSIN's Climate Change and Nursing webinar series. Um, the webinar series, uh, our focus is to support dialogue on the important topic of climate change and nursing. Um, I did want to just make everyone aware that uh, this session is being recorded. You see in the top left hand corner of the Zoom screen, you'll see the word recording with a, a red flashing light. So that means the session is being recorded. Um, the recording is going to be posted on the Causin website and shared through Causin's networks as part of the dissemination strategy for this project. Uh, today's session, we're going to begin with, uh, with some speakers, presentations from our speakers, and then we'll conclude with 20 minutes of question and answer. And before we get too far into things, we want to begin in a good way with Elder Annie. So before, uh, before we move on with our presentation, we want to take a moment to respectfully acknowledge that Causin's National Office is located on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin people. I'd also like to welcome Elder Annie Smith St. George's, a well-recognized Algonquin elder born and raised on the Kittigan Zibi Reserve near Manawaki, Quebec. Elder Annie has worked very closely with Cousin to inform and guide this project. Elder Annie, I invite you now to open today's session with a prayer and a blessing. The <laughs> Mujer <laughs> I'm Annie Smith St. George, Kishkwanakot, my traditional name. And um, I was run and I was raised in Manawaki and Kitagan Zibi. I was raised off the land. And today, why we do this? Why do we give a prayers? Why do we give thanks? We give thanks to the creator for everything we have. 
as we look up to the sky and every day we see the sun that shines upon us, we give thanks to the sun that shines upon us, that give us warmth, that gives us such a beautiful day like today, light. And that reminds us that each day is a new day and that's a new beginning. And it also warms us. And also as we look up to the sky world, we look at the moon, the moon that glitters and shines up night, influences all the waters and in, in the galaxy and influences all the waters of Mother Earth. That means from even small lakes to rivers and to the oceans. So we give thanks to that. And also in the sky world, we have the stars, the planets. The planets are very vast, very big, it's infinity. And each of those stars have a galaxy around them, around them, and it's so huge. And these stars were guided our ancestors. We thank the creator for these stars, every galaxy, everything. Our galaxy, our earth, and this, the planet around our earth resembles exactly what we have in our body. We give thanks for each cell. If we look at a cell of our body, it's a replication of the sky world, our planet, our galaxy, which just, and so we thank the creator for that. Thank the creator for the bird lives, all the birds on, on this earth, not only one type of bird, but throughout the world. For these birds, some are, these birds, we eat them. Some give life, their lives to us so we could nourish our bodies. And not only we use for our garments and we use for prayer and we honor the bird life. Without the birds, there will be, they too seed, they too <clears throat> bring forth growth on earth. And we go to the four leggeds now, the four leggeds. We take the bear, we'll take a bear example, the four legged. The bear will eat the blueberries, and with the elimination, we'll create other berries. And it'll, it'll grow and make growth into other fruits and little fruits that we need. And also the four legged, all the four legged throughout the world do that. And it also all together, not separate, together. And then we go into the fish life, the world, the water, the underwater the fish life, the foods that they we eat and the trout and the nice, beautiful fish, salmon, and everything we have, we give thanks for that. It's very important. And also we give <clears throat> thanks to uh, the cleaners, the snakes, the crawlers from the earth to the tiniest, tiniest little tardigrad that you would find naked. You can't see them with the naked eye. You, so tiny, but yet so busy. The ants, the bees, all of them, insects, will, is all inclusive. The trees, the wind, the air that we breathe, the waters we drink, all of those elements, every one of those elements that I'm talking about, we give thanks because they are a part of us. The trees, the sand, the earth, the sky to the water, we compose of all that. It's all in our bodies. And when you look up to the sky world and you look down, you don't see us microscopically either. We're very, very tiny. We 
you don't see, all you see is massive earth and water. And so we as human, however, we're given a special gift on this earth. We're given a gift of the mind to be able to understand and to be able to work together. We're given the gift of the hearing to hear also and to see beauty, to see the beautiful things around us. All is there for us, all of it. And we have to give thanks to every day what we see. We see a little squirrel running by, makes us laugh. We're interconnected. And that's why when we open up, we always say all our relations, everything. Because everything is, we're winning, living with everything. And a part of everything is within us. And so the understanding of a climate change now is to be able to understand why we do this. And it's, it's a repetitive prayer because we want to have the people to understand that all what on earth, and this is the only garden we have is here. They're thinking of going to Mars, but they won't find nothing much in Mars. Probably sand, rocks, things like that, you know. But it's it's there, and it's okay for them to go and see it. But we really don't need to see it because we know already what's there. They know. And so, but us here, we got to take care of what we have here. You got to take care, like as you take care of your children, like as you take care of your home like as you take care of yourselves. We got to take care of Mother Earth. And we don't have much time because human time, humankind got curious. Humankind started to, to want more, more in things in life. And we got to come together now to say, wait a minute. It is time that we look at things because it's now not hurting everything on climate it's 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 everybody together now because we don't have much time they say 30 40 years i see let's say that we have this and we're going to maintain and keep this because they're now the oceans the vast underworld ocean a world of its own that we don't even know with the mammals and everything in the everything in the ocean at large is polluted. If we look at the soft water lakes, there is it's polluted. If we look at the rivers, our fish are sick and it's polluted. And this pollution affects our bodies and you and the health also are included in this climate change, which I'm happy to see. And I'm very grateful that you take part because you are working towards better health, towards our generation of our children. Even this tiny little virus that is we're dealing with today, it's killing our people. And so we got to come together and we got to start thinking now, no go, today. Not tomorrow, today, as we meet. And so I'm meeting scientists, I'm meeting you guys, I'm meeting everybody. And then the message is going out that we got to move together, not one element at a time, but everything inclusively for humankind. Because at the end of the day, if there's no water, we cease to exist. The four-legged cease to exist. The trees will die. Everything will go. And today, we are in an area where there's danger there. And also, we are in an area where we're, we're, we're literally polluting ourselves. And we are going to be at risk. The poles, which the north to the south, Antarctica, is melting. And 
they have found diseases now in the Antarctica, if microbes, a, a virus. Now these are million, million years of dead viruses that were there. Are they going to come back alive? I'm concerned. So we have to be very extremely careful the world that we're going to be living in. And the world will go and be living my great grandchildren with my children, my grandchildren. And so I'm not, I'm not only speaking for myself, I'm speaking for all humankind on this earth. All of us, from what nation we are, from where we come from, from all what we do, all of us together, we have to start taking care of what we have now. Otherwise, the earth is going to, is she suffering? And she is going to see more and more big tornadoes where we haven't ever seen it. We're going, you're going to see tornadoes. We, my grandmothers used to say, oh, don't be afraid of Zimsido. Tornadoes, they don't touch people. They go in the bush. Now they're hitting the big cities at a huge level, level four, five destruction. And it's, it, but tornadoes is a cleansing, the cleaning the air. That's what it does, it cleans the air. And after the Tino or tornado passes, the air is much cleaner and drier. So we gotta, we're living with Mother Earth trying to re, re-clean herself each time. And we have to, and there's the ways to do it. And we have to start listening to each other and speak at large, all of us together. And that's why we people, our people walk to protest for this, to walk for that, to talk together so that it is not only for us. They see, we are taught at, at a at a young level to take care of the earth because that's the only garden we have we feed from we eat from we drink from we breathe from and we are all special in this room here in this forum each and every one of us have an experience to share each every one of us have a gift and we could contribute to mother earth and the prayer the thanks That's what we say. We thank everything because it's all our relations. Without it, we cease to exist. Miigwech. I will leave you to go on with your session time. But I just wanted to tell you why we open up in such a way, in this way, in a good way. Okay? And in an harmonious way. We should work together for the future generations of not only the indigenous, but in all nations, and all on Mother Earth. For we are completing the Earth. We are the garden. We come with different color hairs, different color, everything. We're different. Every one of us is so different from each other. And that's the beauty of humankind, is we are our unique selves. And like a flower in a garden, there's not one flower that has the same petal. It's all different forms, you know. And we are that rose, that beautiful flower that blooms. And we are so, I am so grateful to be here to do this opening, to announce it, to be a part of your forum. Miigwech. Have a, a few, have a nice session. I'll be closing my camera. Because I like to talk. <laughs> Thanks, Elder. Well, yeah. Alan, Elder, anyway. and I do, and I do not want to interrupt. <laughs> so I will close my camera and my my microphone, and I'll be doing the closing. Not, not a closing. Let's say a new beginning and a farewell. Mm-hmm. How's that? <laughs> That's great. That That's wonderful. Our discussion. Yeah. 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 Well, Alan, Elder, Annie, for your blessing. Yes. Um, and now it's my. It's my pleasure now uh, to introduce our first guest speaker, Maureen Gustafson. Steering, she's a steering committee member uh, for the Indigenous Climate Action. 
Maureen Anishinaabekwe of mixed Ojibwe and settler heritage, a member of Maureen, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce the, <laughs> the community name, I apologize. Cushing, Cushishing, a First Nation, you could correct me in a second, uh, Treaty 3 Territory. She holds a master's of public health from uh, Dalalana School of Public Health. She's a passionate advocate and for the value of indigenous ways of knowing, doing and being in promoting ecological public health and is privileged to sit on the National Steering Committee for Indigenous Climate Action an indigenous led organization working to connect and support communities to reinforce their places as leaders driving climate change solutions for today and tomorrow. Maureen, can you correct me on the community name? I wanna make sure we get that correct. Absolutely, no worries. It's Kuchiching First Nation. So I think you got it um, and I appreciate the question. So I'm just gonna pull up my slides here. Is everyone seeing the slides? Great, okay, wonderful. So our practice paid off earlier. Um, so thanks so much for the welcome. Um, I'm really excited to be here today to share a little bit about the work that ICA does. Um, before I jump right in though, I just wanted to take a minute to share a bit about myself and how I relate to, to this work and the people who are doing it and the lands and the waters and all the non-human relatives that we engage in our work. So I'm from Kuchiching First Nation, which is in Treaty 3 territory pictured on the left. Um, as was mentioned, I have mixed Anishinaabe, uh, Ojibwe and settler heritage, and I grew up nearby in a small town called Fort Francis. I'm currently living in Thunder Bay, which is about four hours east of where I'm from. Um, it's pictured on the right here. Thunder Bay is also located in Anishinaabe territory in the Robinson Superior Treaty area. So that's a little bit about me. As you all know, I'm here because I'm a member of ICA's National Steering Committee. ICA is Indigenous Climate Action. I'll refer to it that way from now on. Um, ICA is an Indigenous-led organization guided by knowledge keepers, water protectors, and land defenders from across the settler state of Canada. And our work and our mission is based on the fundamental belief that Indigenous ways of knowing, doing, and being and Indigenous rights are critical to the flight, the fight, sorry, for climate justice. Um, so some of you may have heard the statistic that Indigenous people protect over 80% of the world's biodiversity, while only representing about 5% or so of the world's population. So our people have always coexisted with the lands, the waters, the animals, you know, any Elder Annie mentioned the four leggeds, the birds, all sorts of other non human relatives that we really cherish and value. And so, yeah, we've, we've coexisted with these um, beings in a balanced and reciprocal way for millennia. This was not by coincidence or good fortune, it was intentional, and in most cases, it was necessary to our survival. We know that living reciprocity with creation still is essential to our survival on a global level. But society in general, we're just not doing a very good job at it right now, which is why we're here talking about this today. Um, and Indigenous people are still trying to revitalize our ways of life following a really brutal period of um, colonization, which is still ongoing in many ways. So all of this really speaks to the importance of Indigenous leadership in the climate justice movement and taking back our power as Indigenous people. So ICA was born in 2015 and has been led by a National Steering Committee since 2017. Our work is modeled after the Indigenous Rights Framework of Free, Prior and Informed Consent and Self-Determination. I've already shared a bit about how the Steering Committee operates, um, what our purpose is. I guess I'll just add that I'm one of about 15 Steering Committee members from across so-called Canada. And uh, now we'll get into the good stuff. So you know, a little bit about the work that we do. Um, there's a lot of different ways that I could talk about this, I guess. So really, I think we'll focus on the five main pathways of our work. So the first is gatherings. So we organize and participate in gatherings at the regional, national and international levels that bring together people to build relationships and to support effective and just climate solutions. Obviously this area of work has been put on hold right now due to the pandemic, we can't really be gathering, 
but we're hoping it won't be too long until we can start thinking about what gatherings might look like in a post-COVID world as more and more folks get vaccinated, which is really, really exciting. So our second area of work or pathway is amplifying voices. Um, we try our best to amplify voices in the climate, sorry, voices of Indigenous people in the climate discourse because often our voices are left out or people are trying to speak for us. So, you know, we as an organization have this platform. How can we use it to support people and communities who are really leading this work and give them a voice? We do this through a number of different avenues. I encourage you guys to check out our social media channels and our website to learn more. There's lots of great stuff on there. Um, there's a podcast in the works that should be coming out this year, which we're really excited about. So that's great. And these are just some examples of webinars and press releases that we've put together over the past year. Like I said, there's lots more out there. So please feel free to check it out. I'll have some links at the end of this presentation for that. So our third pathway is resources and tools. Um, and so based on this, a key focus for us is creating resources and tools that support Indigenous communities in their work as climate justice leaders. So for example, we've been working really hard on our Indigenous Worldview Climate Change Toolkit over the past year. Um, it's coming together and it'll be probably be piloted with communities in the coming months. We also have some other resources and tools that are under development. So again, uh, we don't have tons of time to cover everything here, but I'll refer you to the website if you want to learn more. There's lots of great stuff there. Our fourth pathway or focus is supporting communities' inherent right and authority to make decisions about their well-being. So Indigenous sovereignty, in other words. And again, this goes back to the idea of self-determination and free prior and informed consent. That can look like a lot of different things, um, some examples of which might be supporting renewable energy projects in communities or providing micro grants for climate justice initiatives. Um, this also looks like standing in solidarity with communities who are really on the front lines defending their territories against extractive industries. And this is a big one. So um, I just wanna acknowledge that for some of you discussions around sovereignty and especially around frontline work might fall a bit outside of your comfort zone, especially for those of you whose work is a little more clinical, right? but I think it's so relevant to nursing and I'm gonna tell you why from my perspective. Um, I'm not a nurse, but uh, you know, these are just some ideas about how, how things might mesh. So I know lots of nursing programs offer classes in community health and health promotion, or maybe lots of you have um, come across these concepts or ideas in your work. So I'm inviting you to think back to those classes or those work experiences to consider concepts like advocacy, social determinants of health, socio-ecological models of health, empowerment, all sorts of things like that. So these are good starting points from which to understand how this work relates to nursing. Um, we can't necessarily stop there because a lot of these are Western concepts. So you're going to have to build on them or take them a step further just to try and wrap your head around um, Indigenous concepts that I've mentioned, like self-determination, like sovereignty, like free prior and informed consent, um, all of which are really important. So again, I'm just trying to frame this in terms of like language or concepts that might be a little bit more familiar to you. So you have a starting point or a reference point, or maybe folks already know this stuff too, and that's great. Um, so anyways, I hope that that's helpful. Our fifth pathway is new, and it's something we're all really excited about. So the Healing Justice Pathway at ICA was born out of the recognition that Indigenous folks bear the brunt of climate-related health impacts in many ways and have been putting their well-being and safety at risk on the front lines for decades, if not longer. There's a really strong need for healing as individuals, as communities, and as nations. And when I say nations, I don't mean settler states, I mean Indigenous nations. Um, and from an Indigenous perspective, also just want to emphasize that, you know, when we talk about healing, we're not just talking about physical healing or health, although that's part of it. We're also talking about mental health, um, emotional health, spiritual health, and healing. Um, so it's very holistic. And so an initial outcome of this work, because it's still in its infancy, has been providing opportunities for two ICA staff members whose health and well-being were in severe jeopardy after decades of frontline work to take wellness sabbaticals for varying amounts of time. Uh, so moving forward, this work is gonna continue to shape our internal operations and how the, the staff kind of work together. 
as well as the other pathways that I've mentioned during this presentation. So it's really something that's going to be woven throughout all of the work that we do, uh, which is really, really exciting. So stay tuned for that. These are some of the partners who we're really, really lucky to work with. Um, can't go through them all right now, but would encourage you to check them out as well if you're curious or you have the time. Um, and I think that's it for me before I hand it back to the folks at Kazan. Just wanted to say miigwech or thank you so much for having me. Miigwech to Elder Annie for the opening. Um, and please check out our website and our social media channels to keep up with our work and to learn more about how you can support. So that's it for me. Thank you so much. Alala Maureen, that was great, thank you. We're now gonna hear from another guest speaker is June Kaminsky. She's an instructor and course designer and curriculum coordinator at the University of British Columbia and Kwantlen Polytechnic University. In addition to these roles, her research activities and being the lead content developer for the climate-driven vector-borne disease and nursing e-resource, June is also an active board member of the Canadian Association of Nurses for the Environment. Uh, along, with, uh, along with her will be Mike Foley, a web designer of the e-resource and a founding partner of technology companies Pixelera and Member365. Welcome June and Mike. Thanks so much, Cheyenne. And I'm just going to load my PowerPoint. So we're just going to spend a few minutes now going over the vector-borne diseases in Canada e-resource, which um, these uh, series of webinars have been focusing on, and looking at how we have uh, included Indigenous consultation and some interweaving of content into this resource. So basically, uh, this very short part of the presentation will focus on a little bit of a project overview, how, how we designed the e-resource, how we included Indigenous consultation and integration of Indigenous content into the e-resource. Sorry. First of all, we'd like to acknowledge the extensive number of people who have given their time and their energy into helping us to get the sea resource off the ground. And I've got a list here. You can see there's a broad number of people, um, including our advisory committee, various stakeholders, as well as the Canadian and Indigenous Nurses Association. Uh, the project title, which is very long, is called Empowering the Next Generation of Healthcare Professionals with Knowledge, Skills, Tools, and Supports to Address Infectious Diseases Related to Climate Change in Canada. So you'll see there's a very strong focus on climate change as the initiator of these infectious disease risks, etc. We started this project in 2018 and plan to finish it this summer and it was funded by the Public Health Agency of Canada. So you can see what our ultimate goal was basically to increase the capacity of nursing faculty, nursing students, practicing nurses, nursing administration, etc., about climate-driven vector-borne diseases by increasing their knowledge as well as fostering an integration of this knowledge into education programs. So to do that, we wanted to make a tool that was useful, ready to use, etc. So again, our target population, basically our primary population is schools of nursing. And uh, this will be available in both English and French, as well as practicing nurses and, and any other nurses. So our key deliverables um, were, we already have the guidelines up on the CASC site, so there is now, and then as well, the electronic resource that we're working on now and just getting ready to launch, and that should be ready by summer. We had an extensive project advisory committee from a number of different areas, as you can see, the full of different universities, different associations organizations and so forth and it goes on to another page so really wonderful program advisory committee very knowledgeable we have had lots of great input from them. 
And this is just a screenshot of the resource that I, um, our initial resource or guidelines that I just spoke about. So this is the one that's available on the CASP website. Just go there and, and you'll see where to download it. And then this is what the e-resource will look like when we're finished. This is basically a screenshot of the entry page and all of the modules, etc., will be quickly available as well as other resources related to it. Um, I had the pleasure to work with this team. So was, we were five people working together, including Michael Foley, Andrea Harvey, Morgan Magnuson, and Shannon Vandenberg. And we are basically the ones who pulled this five modules together and sat down with the reviewers and so forth and the experts and got feedback and then re revised it and so forth. So it's a great team to work with as well as with Julia as our lead. So the e-resource design, we wanted to pull in some specific contents to make it open for one, so it's free to use. Uh, an online teaching tool that people can download as a toolkit, and uh, Michael will address that a bit more um, when he's speaking. And then uh, to give content that's viable to, sh to share and, and to help people to work with their individual clients and communities. And, uh, any kind of problems that they may come up with related to vector-borne diseases. So this is just this is just the summary of our four guiding principles. We guided our work. So we really felt it was necessary to incorporate an interprofessional and intersectoral collaboration, to use sensitive language and so forth, and uh, make sure that we recognize the beliefs of a number of different people about climate-related health effects. And then uh, the last two, uh, showing a very respectful acknowledgement of Indigenous people and their respective territories, and to try to bring in some of the understanding that comes from, from this. Also to look at multiple ways of knowing and to tie those with it into the content. So basically how we've organized this is to address the 34 learning outcomes, which are reflected in the initial guidelines that are already available. And so that has been transposed over five modules. So these are the modules all listed here. So if you went to module one, you would look at climate change as a general overview. Number two would look at vector-borne diseases in Canada in general. Three would look at primary and secondary prevention. Four would look at tertiary prevention. And then five, awareness and advocacy. And again, there's a, st a strong focus on climate change throughout all of these pieces, as well as how that relates to uh, increased vector-borne disease risk. So each module follows a very standardized structure. And then on the left, you can see listed all the different pieces of each module. And then within all of that, uh, the module is further divided into lessons. And this just shows you an example of what the lesson menu would look like if you accessed it. So it provides smaller chunks of information. So each module is fairly long. So they're about 100, page, 100 slides long. So it's very helpful to have this broken down into distinct lessons. So our Indigenous consultation. Again, we engaged with very diverse groups of representatives from very multiple groups. And you can see listed in here uh, that included Indigenous experts, health professionals, and national organizations. And then specific consultation occurred during the summer of 2020, beginning with our stakeholder engagement webinars, which occurred in June, um, and then followed by an internal review by um, Cheyenne, who is our moderator this morning in June and July, and an external review at an official uh, meeting of different Indigenous peoples and health experts in August. So uh, a number of different times the modules were shared and uh, input was consulted about that. Now the rest of this part of my uh, presentation, I just, I'd just like to show you a bit about how Indigenous content was woven into the modules. This particular table just gives you a little bit of a summary and I've specifically targeted the different pages and so forth. So there's about 50 pages or so that specifically relate to um, Indigenous consultation or knowledge or considerations and so forth. 
So it's, uh, you'll see that module one has a very large chunk, big piece of 30 pages straight, etc. And then others integrate case studies, particular standalone pages, maybe you know, like cultural safety resources, a page of resources that people can go to for other information and so on. And um, so those are spread out from module one to five. So let's just look a little bit at some of these screens. And again, these are just a, a handful of, of those 50 pages that I discussed. But you can look at how it's presented and so forth and, and gives questions so that people can those things like, for instance, how can traditional knowledge inform preservation of health, sustainable actions, and environmental stewardship? So it goes into looking at that um, in a little bit more detail. Another one introduces just a very brief definition of what traditional knowledge is, and basically hopes to spark the nursing students or nurses' interest um, in this and, and try to consider why is this important for nurses to know and so forth. Another one looks at um, introducing how many nations there are across Canada, and uh, as of 2017, there were 630 First Nations in Canada, <clears throat> excuse me, 53 Inuit, and then various Métis communities. So, and within that, that represents over 50 distinct nations and 50 Indigenous languages. So just showing how wonderfully diverse, etc., the, the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples are in Canada. So throughout, say, module one, within that uh, lesson two, there are different screens looking at different First Nations concepts, uh, Métis concepts, and Inuit. And this is just an example of one of the Inuit ones that is uh, showcasing a strategy that was outlined in a particular document that proposed a holistic approach um, in looking at climate change and how to address that within the communities. As well, there's quite a significant section within that on the truth and reconciliation calls to action, specifically the ones that relate to nursing and healthcare. So there's uh, quite a few um, screens just showing each action on its own so that the reader can really consider it and see how that could relate to their practice and so forth. And then um, this is an example in module two of considerations when they're starting to look at vector-borne diseases that nurses should look at, et cetera. And then gives a link at the bottom to give uh, more information on indigenous climate action. And I believe that's the, uh, the organization that Marine was just talking about. So also all through this, there are links to other resources and so forth that if uh, the reader wants to find out more that they can do so. This is an example of a case study that is introduced in Module 2. So Module 2, again, is looking at vector-borne diseases in Canada in general, introducing a young boy who may have uh, Lyme's disease, but is just in the process of pre-diagnosis. And it goes through several different screens of talking about that case study. And then it's in Module 4, when they start looking at tertiary uh, prevention, um, it's continued. and. and uh, the nurse walks through trying to find out uh, what's happening with this little boy. So this is this is the nurse that I was just talking about, and she's looking at asking herself something like, how could she integrate Indigenous ways of knowing and cultural safety into her care of this little boy and his family? Um, in module three, when they're looking at primary and secondary prevention, this is another screen where you can uh, to caution the reader to consider about Indigenous communities, etc., that uh, why they may be more prone to BBDs and, and how they may choose to treat it, etc., to deal with it and so forth. So it's uh, another nice one that makes people think about this. And then this is an example of, of uh, other resources that they can uh, consult to look at cultural safety and so forth. So forth. Within module four, which again is the uh, tertiary prevention, there are five pages that look specifically at the importance of cultural safety. And I don't, I think almost every uh, 
health region across Canada is supporting this in some way or another. So the reader may be already familiar with this, but we wanted to put this in context as well with uh, providing BBD care, et cetera, which is vector borne disease care. And also things like um, the importance of elders. And um, as you just witnessed with Elder Annie, it's just so important to have the elder voice within this to, to lead the way and to create space, et cetera, for really good work in this area. Um, and then module five, which is the final module looking at um, awareness and advocacy has some slides. And in this particular one, it's trying to show nurses how if they wanted to work with a community to help them to deal with vector borne diseases, et cetera, what, what a normal uh, protocol would be so that you would always consult with the community and engage with them and let the solutions come from the community, that you would meet with chief and counsel, that you would meet with any kind of health services, et cetera, that they had within the community first, and then also meet with community members and so forth, including elders, asking for their input into planning and implementation and so forth, so that everything is community initiated. Another example is um, part of the case study. This is a, a student nurse who's been asked by a community to find some more preventative resources, asking them to maybe find some more natural ways to prevent tick bites and so forth. So he's going to look for something and did find this poster, which has um, some natural and some chemical sprays and so forth that people can use. And then a final one is um, supporting indigenous voices and how important that is to support um, activism and so forth and any kind of, of ways that communities are trying to overcome any kind of barriers that they have to have good BBD care and how uh, nurses can be aware of the needs and so forth. So I'm going to hand it over to Michael or to Cheyenne to introduce Michael. Going, Thanks, Michael. June. So, so in creating all this great content, the challenge now is to get it into the hands of everyone who wants to use it. Um, the uh, object of putting this online is, uh, is, is to do that exactly. So we created a website where you can actually go to and, uh, and get access to the e-resource. Uh, and the three targets that we have on the, on the website are educators, students, and professionals. So educators, uh, sorry, the, the different methods of delivery that we've created. Um, sorry, June, if you want to page ahead to the next slide. Um, the different methods of delivery that we are, that we have chosen are, you can download a full package. Uh, you can download a single module, or you can uh, come to the to the vector borne disease website and actually access the uh, e resource here. Um, so for educators, sorry, June, I'll have to get you to skip ahead to the next. Sorry, it's stuck on me. It's for some reason, it's not letting me. I'll try oh, to okay. Back. There we go. Um, if you want to go to the next one, sorry. So for educators, what educators can do is they have they have three different modes. They can send the students to the vector borne disease website to use the modules, um, and on the on the website you will have access to all five modules, um, each split out into the their individual lessons. Um, another method is you can actually download the complete e resource package. Uh, and doing this, uh, you can pick and choose which one of which modules you want to include in your um, program. Um, so you can simply uh, use module one and module five if you want. But the modules have all components. So you have the the lessons and the uh, quizzing the test your knowledge at the end. And the last uh, method for educators is that they can import just the single module so they can download uh, module five, if they want, from the website and import it into their learning management system at their institution or organization. Um, if we continue to the next slide, 
students have access. Um, it, students may uh, come across this content on their own uh, through this website, and they will have access to the all the different modules as well. And as you can see here, this is set up in our own little uh, learning management system. So you can go in and you can actually do modules one through five at your own speed, and it will track your completion rate as you go through. So students can come in and just for their own personal knowledge do that. And then for professionals, similar, similar to the uh, educators, uh, professionals who are part of associations or organizations that have uh, healthcare workers, um, they can also come to the website, download the applications and import them into their own learning management system. Um, and then they can alert their members of the availability uh, through their either their membership uh, emails uh, or through their, their own websites. The timeline that it took for us to go through this, uh, we started in January 2020 with a kickoff meeting here in Ottawa. Um, we all met and uh, we started the development of the draft content at that point. Uh, many consultation calls, uh, CASN reviews, the stakeholder reviews, uh, expert consultation with Indigenous experts, uh, gender experts. And in August of last year, we revised the content and actually started production of the uh, modules themselves. And we're currently going through final testing of the modules and the French translation and with a, uh, with a delivery timeline of, of spring of this year. And with that, I'll pass it on to Cheyenne. Okay. Uh, thanks, June and Mike. Uh, we do have some time, a little bit of time, um, six minutes. We do want to give the opportunity to those of you um, on the, in this session to pose any questions to any of our presenters. If you have a question, we do ask that you put it in the chat. It will help us um, moderate the questions from there. So there is a question from Jody. Are there activities and discussion questions to bring these concepts into the classroom for discussion? How about outcome measures? So maybe June or Mike, I don't know. If either there you want are, to answer that question? Well, there are case studies woven throughout and there are critical moment questions that are like, interspersed throughout each module for them to stop, stop and think. And at the end, there is a self-assessment cluster of five to 10 questions just to uh, test their learning. Uh, there's also uh, uh, learning outcomes that they're expected to, to assess, but that's as far as we got, as, as far as assessment goes. But like Michael said, that you can bring this right into your learning management system and you yourself might come up with some questions or some, you know, some kind of activity that they could do along with that. So I think it's it's the resource makes it quite easy for you to to build off of. I'll add to what June says too. Um, I would say there's probably anywhere between five to fifteen stop points within each module that are we call them uh, uh, thinking moments. Um, so absolutely, you can you can uh, use that time to consider within the uh, within the program. Okay, and uh, Jody's response was great. So we can bring those critical questions into the classroom. How wonderful this resource is! Work, thank you. So that was Jody's response. We do have another question from Kara. What's the web address for the re e resource and can we access it via the Cousin website? So I'll turn it over to Julia, perhaps, to if she's there. Oh, hi, Julia. Hi, thank you for that question. Um, we don't have the specific URL yet because the e-resource is not yet launched. Um, we're still in those final phases, as was mentioned. Um, however, uh, it will be accessible from the Cousin site, and everyone that has um, contacted us, expressed interest, or registered for these webinars, we'll get an email notification as soon as it is released, um, and, and you'll receive a, a, the URL. Thanks for that, Julia. 
if there's another question, we do have time for another. Just looking at the chat. Oh, I think that uh, Cheyenne, your computer is frozen. I'll My just, oh, you're back. Oh. <laughs> yeah, I was just um, wondering if there was another question. I was just watching the chat to see if anyone was asking any more questions. I don't see any. If anyone does have any questions, um, oh, Jody has another. Are there any other climate focused resources in the works? At Tazin, not currently, we're not uh, creating any resources. However, we are fully intended on looking at funding so that we can build on this work as, as vector-borne disease is just one aspect as one knows of climate change. So there is great um, opportunity for us to, to do more. Thank great, you. Thanks. Don't see any more questions. If you do think of a question that you would like to ask, you can email Julia. Um, does everyone have your email address, Julia? Um, I think you should. It's jthomas at kazan.ca. You should, if you had received a, an email from me with the uh, Zoom link, that's uh, you can just reply to that. Um, and our contact information is also on our Kazan site. And I'd be happy to one. answer more questions um, offline as well. Yeah, great. And there's one last question. It just came um, as the direct message to me, so I'll pose it. Uh, the question is, how long does the course take to complete? Not if June or Michael. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, it, it can take anywhere from uh, it can take anywhere from 20 minutes per module to three hours per module. It all depends on how uh, how in depth you go into the content. Um, each one of the slides typically has a um, either a question or it has an activity or it has a uh, kind of discoverable content. So it all depends on how much time you spend. Um, and not including the uh, the additional what do they call them? Internet wormholes you can go down when you click on the links to the external sites with all of the resources as well. So, but I would say I would say an hour to an hour and a half would probably be what I would judge for each module. Great, thanks, Mike. And the, the person who posed the question says thank you as well. All right. Um, so thank you to Maureen and June and, and Michael for uh, your presentations today and for everyone who asked a question. Like I said, if you have questions, you can send them over to Julia and we will get you an answer. Uh, so like I said at the beginning, this session was recorded, is being recorded, was recorded, and it will be, ma be made available on the Kazan YouTube channel and circulated to you in the coming days. And feel free to share that link once you get it with your networks. Everyone's saying thank you, so that's great. Um, so thank you again to everyone, and, and Kazan certainly hopes that you will consider attending the last session of the series set on March 26th. And the theme of that is advocacy in nursing and climate change. So visit Kazan, C-A-S-N.ca, and search for Kazan Climate Change and Nursing Webinars for more information. And everyone is saying thank you in the chat. Uh, Julie, was there a plan to have Annie sort of close the session? I wasn't quite yes, sure. Yes, I, I would like to give um, Annie opportunity to close the se uh, session if if uh, Annie can hear us, if she's still there. I know she had stepped away for a minute. Oh, hi, there she Annie. Is. Hi, Elder Annie. Hi. I, uh, I kind of... Um, moved uh had a phone call i had to address two and how did it go <laughs> it went well thank you elder annie you want to help us uh close the session for the day yes
kakinawiak was in chum. Chikjamego chumidokum kakinawiak was in chum. I thank the creator for this forum and um, I thank the creator for being, for all of you being here in this uh, new way, different way. And, um, but at least we could communicate. I thank the creator for that. And um, miigwech. And I ask the creator to keep you safe wherever you are from this virus and uh, to help you continue your walk in, uh, in this uh, climate change and the health and um, the, to be able to uh, come together again and we could speak on this big issue. It's gonna be a long-term discussion as we move forward because we're going into an era where we have to talk and I thank the Creator for giving me this opportunity to be with you. Ça fait plaisir d'être avec vous. Cet après-midi. And uh, to be able to listen in. And also to take part at times. Miigwech. Keep safe all of you. And nigawa min watch. That means I will see you again. And I was honored to, uh, to be a part of your form. However, you know... We, a lot of elders have gone this year, left through COVID. A lot of our teachings are gone. And, um, you know, when an elder comes in with knowledge, and there's not too much that have lived on the land, not too many of us have, uh, have uh, know about the whole land culture or was taught. Um, there, there's a lot, there's not many that have lived that kind of life. Like I, I had the good opportunity of living that kind of life and appreciating also the animals that we, that my dad had, uh, uh, trapped and hunt and was injured and, uh, it would, he would bring them home and mom would, my mother would care for them. And I had an opportunity to live among these little creatures, to live among uh, the animal world. And um, I grew up in that fashion. And I also went trapping hunting. And um, also I was taught a lot of things by the old people from Kitagon CB. They gave, they, I'm honored to be given a lot of their teachings. So me to carry on and um, so to me, it's a gift that I'm offering you, the part of me, part of who I am. And um, there is, they're leaving quite fast, a lot of elderly, and now I'm in that category. And uh, because of this COVID, and so, uh, you know, I think I would suggest if elders come on, more is to give them a little bit more time to be able to teach a little bit of what they have so that you could take it with you and carry the teachings these are important teachings that we talk about land we talk about mother earth we talk about different issues with vectors what not to do and what to do and so a, a lot of people uh, elderly people now and there's only very few of us that have lived that kind of life, which I was very honored. I was poor as a child, but yet I was very happy and, and content because I had all the animals. I had a bear, just to finish a little, little word off here. I had a, a bear of 500 pounds was my pet as a child. Grew up with a bear, a live bear, black bear. She was our baby. And it's not everybody that could live that today. And I had a beautiful experience of living with, along with the bear hibernation and what they do and their characteristics. And um, so, miigwech, just to share a bit 
on what who I am and where I want. Miigwech. Good on you. Miigwech. Thank you. Uh -huh. Bye bye. Have a nice day. Miigwech. <laughs> Thank you, Elder Annie. Uh -huh. Thank you, everyone. Miigwech. Have a good afternoon. Miigwech. You too. All of you. Bye bye. <laughs> They go up, man. Bye, Justin. Julia, did you want me to stay on or were you good? <laughs>